career chin wags for the 21st century. I'm a career practitioner called Catherine Cunningham, and I've worked with thousands of clients over the past 20 years or so, so I've had quite a bit of time to think about career issues. Each podcast, I pick up on an issue that takes my fancy. Some episodes are quite practical, such as episode 11, where I talk about how to write a great cover letter. Other episodes tend to cover more big picture topics, like podcast 24, where I use marketing advice from the world's top business experts to help you stay in front of mind in your target market. In today's episode, I'm taking a break from my regular podcasts and switching across to the series that I call Short, Sharp and Shiny. In each episode in this series, I'm going to talk about a tip, something I've noticed or something I've learned. I'm going to tell you a short war story and I'm going to finish with analysing and building on a career quote. And all of this is meant to help you better manage your careers, of course. So let's start with the war story. I often joke, and so far people laugh with me, I think, not at me, that I'm a bit of a dinosaur. So 20 years ago, there was a crisis of some sort. I can't remember what it was, actually. And I was working with somebody who was in management in an international school. And that market was literally decimated, as in nine out of 10 jobs went. And being management, of course, it was worse rather than if she'd been an actual tutor or an actual lecturer. Let's call her Annie. Now, in her communication style, Annie came across as a real feeler. So what do I mean by that? There's an analysis that you can do, which is based on Carl Jung's work. So Carl Jung's work with MBTI talks about 16 different personality preferences. This work, which is called I Speak, as in I Speak Your Language, distills these 16 types down to four. And the four types are feeler, thinker, sensor, and intuitor. In theory, we have one style that we turn to when we're quite relaxed with family and friends, but that under stress, our style changes. The issue and the problem with with this is that generally, and I'm going to be very um, blunt here, nobody likes the other three styles. And so if you persist in communicating with somebody in your default style, when the other person doesn't like that style, well, of course, that causes issues. And and with me, I talk about issues with interviews. I'm going to give you a little brief background on the styles, bearing in mind it's going to be very superficial. I have written about it in blogs, so if you are interested, and I think I've got a a 60-second video on it, and I've probably got an infographic on it. So if you are interested, go and check that out. The stereotype of a feeler is a kindergarten teacher. And so the rest of the world looks at a feeler and says, well, you know, isn't she sweet? Isn't she cute? But really, this is the real world, honey. And unfortunately, and quite unjustly, they often think that feelers lack intelligence. So pretty disastrous, as you can imagine, in an interview. The second of the styles is a sensor. And the stereotype of a sensor is a salesperson. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Just give me the bottom line. I don't, I don't really care about that stuff. Let's just move on and let's just move on right now. And the rest of the world tends to look at the sensor and think that they're shallow, superficial and perhaps overly harsh. The next style is the one I struggle with the most and it's the thinker. And the stereotype of the thinker is an accountant. So it's somebody who speaks very methodically, carefully considers all of the options after due consideration, decides to go down path number A for the following reasons. And people look at the thinker and think perhaps that they're risk-averse, perhaps that they're boring, perhaps that they're not visionary enough. And the final of the four is the intuitor. And the intuitor, the stereotype, is a mad scientist. And the rest of the world looks at this um, intuitor and thinks, wow, this person has one crazy idea after another. This person is dangerous. No way are we going to listen to this person. In the old days, many people would have the point of view 
I am who I am and I'm not going to change my communication style. That would be fake. A couple of things. The general recommendation is to try and adjust your communication style to better match the style of your listener. And you are always going to be who you are. All we're really talking about here is perhaps just rubbing some of the rough edges off your style so that other people aren't annoyed by it. And finally, nobody really has any trouble working out which of the four styles their listener prefers. The issue is changing their own content and changing their own delivery style. I call this the hundreds and thousands on the icing on the cake. This is very sophisticated, very high level communication skills. So coming back to Annie, we just kept practicing. We would do interview skills practice and she would give an answer and I'd say, no, no, get to the point. And then we'd try again. And I'd say, no, no, give me the numbers. I want numbers. Then we try again. I say, okay, no, now I want you to sound more decisive. She was very, very good at putting up with this and very determined. So lo and behold, two jobs came up and we had a bit of a debate with the one organisation, which level job should she apply for? She ended up applying for the more junior role and she went to the interview and the interview was Friday afternoon. And before she even got home, they had rung her and offered her the more senior role. Where am I going to with this? Annie was tough in the good sense of the word, and she was willing to change. She's still the same person, but she got the job. So my message is, I think, stretch yourself, be aware. I guess the starting point is be aware or talk to somebody who can make you aware. And then have the inner strength or find the inner strength from somewhere to look at what you need to do to change your communication style to get that job that you want. I now want to talk to you about a quick little tip, which is to check your posture. So the days of 19th century women in particular being told to sit up straight, walking around a room with a book on their head, those days are long gone. And to some extent, the fact that they're long gone can adversely affect your success in an interview. It needs to start when you're out in reception, when you turn up for the job interview no more than 10 minutes early and you're sitting in reception. Put your phone away. Don't sit hunched over your phone. Sit up straight, basically, and look calm and put up with the fact that you may have to wait a while and it might be boring. This is one of those times where it is not a good idea to be looking at your phone. When you go into the room, walk with large-ish strides. Don't have a little hesitant, mincing walk and walk with your shoulders back. When you sit in the chair, the rule is that you should sit back in your chair and lean forward slightly with your shoulders back, but not looking like a sergeant major. So you can see how hard this can be, and the sooner you start, therefore, the better. People often ask me, as far as stance, as far as posture, what to do with their hands. I find if you're speaking naturally, your hands are not an issue because your hands will naturally move to reinforce the emotion or the intent behind what you're saying. It tends to be, and this is my very unscientific analysis or my very unscientific point of view with no no experiments to back it up, is that when people practice with me and when they use corporate speak or talk platitudes like, I took my team on a journey, they tend not to use their arms. And I've concluded that it's because it's such fake language that there is no emotional connection. Therefore, their body feels no impulse to reinforce what they're saying with their arms. So typically you would put your arms on your lap or on the arm of the chair so that they're then ready to move around as needed. If you nail stance, you're well on your way to mastering body language. Let's finish off with my quote. It's quite a long one. It's from somebody called M. Scott Peck, who I must say I've never heard of, but I like the quote. Our finest moments are most likely to occur when we are feeling deeply uncomfortable, unhappy or unfulfilled. 
For it is only in such moments, propelled by our discomfort, that we are likely to step out of our ruts and start searching for different ways or truer answers. As always, I like to talk about practical matters. Today's session is really about interview skills, so I want to talk about this quote in relation to interview skills. Occasionally I have a client who will just not do any actual interview skills practice. If that's the case, then I offer a series of bridges. For example, and I do this with everybody, we start by constructing sample answers together so that they can see where I'm heading with my theory. Then I try and tee them up with some of my more gentle consultants. I also talk to them about the fact that when we actually practice, we're just going to start by looking at content. We're not going to worry about what your voice looks like, how you're sitting in the chair. But sometimes people just can't handle it. And I think it's such a pity. It's okay to miss out on a job for the right reason. Either you're not right for them, you don't have the technical skills, you don't have the attitude they're after, the approach, they don't think you match their culture. That's okay. But I think it's such a pity if you miss out on a job because you lack skills at interviews. On a deeper level, I think it's important to ensure that you actually are propelled by discomfort. I meet so many people who are deeply uncomfortable, unhappy or unfulfilled who do nothing about it. This is disastrous in so many ways. It has a terrible effect on our careers, our lives and our families' lives. Now, I'm not a psychologist, but there is so much support out there these days from friends and families and professionals. Find somebody who can help you take a tiny step. I was so scared to get back in the car after my bad injury a few years ago. I can't tell you how slowly I drove. I had to force myself to do it and I only went for a short trip. It worked and now, much to my husband's dismay, I'm back to my zippy self in that car. I don't want to sound flippant, and as I said, I'm not a psychologist, but I often think if I lived in the 19th century, I would have been a peasant in a field in Ireland somewhere tilling the potatoes and wonder what my life would have been like. In the Western world at least, and in Australia at least, we have such immense support out there to help us be happier at work. So all I can do is encourage you to think of who might help you make that first small step and to wish you good luck. Thanks for listening to this podcast. If you like what you've heard, I'd love it if you could share it or leave a review. At this stage, I'm still doing a podcast every few weeks, and next episode, I'm going to revert back to our MBTI series, where I examine each of the 16 famous profiles one at a time. Remember, if you want to review what we've talked about, check out the full show notes at careerconsult.com.au. There you can find perhaps an article on the topic, an infographic or a video, and there'll be links to any tools or resources that I've pointed out. I'll repeat that, careerconsult.com.au. And I do a mail out religiously once a fortnight of videos, blogs and infographics. If you're interested, you can either sign up via the form on the website or just send us an email at admin at careerconsult.com.au and we'll get you going. Let's finish with the hashtag, hashtag, why not be happy at work? 